Hi, Laura. Great to see you. Welcome to Tapped In with Cirilla. Hi, and Sarah. Great to so, be here. Thank you. Yeah, I know a lot's going on with you and you've had some exciting things going on with Zero Proof. Do you want to introduce yourself and share a little bit about your work? Yes, absolutely. Well, my name is Laura Silverman. I am the founder of Zero Proof Nation and Booze Free in D.C., one is a national and international platform devoted to the non-alcoholic movement, culture, everything that ranges from the beverages themselves to bottle shops, uh, bars, um, events. And then my Booze Free in DC platform is more of a hyper-local look at how to explore the Washington DC area from a non-alcoholic perspective and a wellness-based perspective. I have been a Booze Free babe since um, July of 2007. So it's been a while for me and I've seen a lot of changes over time. Um, oh, but I completely forgot to mention, I just came back from the UK in um, last week mm -hmm. or about a week and a half ago, I was a judge at the World Alcohol Free Awards, which is the first award competition series of its kind that's devoted to entirely alcohol-free products. Um, in the UK, it's called alcohol free, and here we, we do non-alcoholic. So there's a, there's a whole different um, sort of, of types of names for beverages. But um, yeah, there are a lot of competitions out there for beverages that are devoted to alcohol. But there's like a subcategory for non-alc, um, mm -hmm. or or people can just submit their products to the category itself, whether they have alcohol or not. Um, but the World Alcohol Free Awards was completely just alcohol free wines beers, spirits, RTDs, um, everything. So it was, it was a really cool experience to yeah. taste a lot of different products in a very short amount of time. <laughs> That's amazing. How long was the event? How many days? It was two full days. Uh -huh. We tasted, uh, with all of the judges combined, we tasted 400 products. I tasted 200 and it was completely blind. So we have no idea what we tasted. Okay. Um, we just tasted the liquids and judged based on taste and complexity and color and all mouthfeel, all of the things that, that go into taste, but we didn't have sort of the, the bias of like the brand story, which for me, right. one, of the, one of the reasons why I love Cirilla so much is the story that, that comes with the beverage. I mean, you have a great product, but it's the story and the mission that really like seals the deal for me. And mm -hmm. I know that just in general with a lot of brands, it, it does that for the consumer. So having to sort of divorce myself from brand stories and, and the brands that I already love and just focus to like solely on taste um, and then writing like copious amounts of notes for each, it was, it was a totally different experience for me. I love that we won a Sophie award with our first flavor and we just submit to a new uh, Sophie this this year for our newest flavor and and that's a blind tasting as well so I think it is really important for brands to have a number of different awards or opportunities to get those the recognition when it does come to just flavor alone yeah and, and as you said it's not just flavor it's like all the senses it's the mouth feel it's the the smell the appearance the clarity and the flavor profile so absolutely um, yeah, I think it, 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 it's it got to be tough, like not to know what the brand is, but I do, I actually like that it removes the bias there um, yeah. because I think so often, like we'll see a brand that we already know, and we've already got an immediate opinion about what's inside, whether it's good or bad. Yeah, no, it's, it's great to remove the bias. And at the same time, the way that I consume non-alcoholic products, I want to consume the whole picture and that and that to me includes the story like why did someone create a non-alcoholic beverage in a world that is becoming more non-alc friendly but in a world that essentially tells you you'll make more money with an alcoholic beverage probably um why are you why are you doing non-alc what's your reason and there's usually an interesting story there uh, whether it's sobriety or recovery whether it's alcoholism in the family, whether it's someone who's a mindful drinker and just wants to present options for people. Um, there's, and, and then there's a whole bunch of reasons, um, you know, medical, medical reasons. Some, some brand founders started their products because they couldn't 
drink alcohol anymore and they still wanted to feel included. So it really mm -hmm. boils down to inclusion and all of the different sub reasons why someone would want to feel that. But, right. um, but yeah, going back to, to blind tasting, it's probably important for products to be judged on the product itself. Yeah. I think that's what keeps people coming back. Yeah. I don't think people will repeat their purchase just for a story or the packaging, that's what's going to draw someone in initially is the packaging. And I think what'll perhaps maintain that brand loyalty is the story that goes along with an excellent flavor. Yeah. And like, if we feel good after, right. Cause I mean, mm -hmm. I've had, I've had products, whether it's food or beverage where maybe it tasted good, but I didn't feel good after. Yeah, like the stomach ache or something and it, or a headache and I'm not going to eat it again or drink yeah. it again. Yeah. Some really good things, good tasting things have just too much sugar <laughs> in them. And, yeah. Um, yeah. So it, it's the whole picture, but it was, it was really interesting. Yeah, that's awesome. And so would you say there is more innovation or more products that you saw in the UK compared with what's going on in the US or would it be the opposite? Well, the UK was kind of the, the original stomping grounds for non-ALK from my understanding, my research, and just hearing what's going on over there. <clears throat> In terms of products that we tasted, I don't know exactly what the breakdown was, but I know that a lot of American brands and brands outside of the UK submitted their products too. So we tasted a combination of things. But when it came to the hospitality element and going out, any bar, any restaurant, whether it was, you know, fine dining down to the dive bars, they all had some sort of options that didn't seem to be afterthoughts. Mm -hmm. um, so I went to a place that was pretty just nondescript in Liverpool, because when I was in the UK, I had to go to Liverpool to mm -hmm. see the Beatles because I'm a huge Beatles fan. And it was just a regular old bar that, well, restaurant, really. I wanted to get um, some food and hopefully have like a non-elk beer to go with it. And ironically, the beer that they had was Brooklyn Brewery. So Liverpool, nice. and they have a lot of great beers in the UK that are non-elk, but why they chose to import Brooklyn Brewery, I don't know, but it was still <laughs> super tasty. Um, but yeah, there, there just seemed to be more plentiful options over there um, mm -hmm. in hospitality and on premise as they call it, um, on trade. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but in terms of product innovation, I think we've really, we've really kind of um, been working hard in the States to, to continue to innovate and to maybe, I wouldn't say out innovate, but match, match what's going on over there. It's interesting what you said about the afterthought part, because I've noticed that a lot because we are working on the on-premise channel and it, it does still feel like a push with a lot of those businesses to yeah. not necessarily to try it or to bring it in, but actually to create space on the menu and actually to create marketing opportunities and mm -hmm. actually to wrap like their head around this could be as profitable, if not more. I mean, according to my research, we're missing out on about half the population at many social venues who either don't drink at all or are trying to moderate. and. Mm -hmm. Instead, you know, they might have one or two alcoholic beverages and then they're looking for a non-alc to fill in. Mm -hmm. We're missing out on at least $10 per customer visit by not offering a quality adult non-alcoholic beverage. We're not talking about like yeah. a juice or a diet soda. So yeah, something sophisticated and worthy. There's a lost um, revenue there. Yeah. Absolutely. It's it's always baffling when when whomever is in charge, whether it's like a bar manager or like a restaurant owner or whatever thinks that it's just not worth it to have those on the menu. But I mean, even the, even the customers that drink alcohol will want, um, mm -hmm. or many of them will want something to switch off with, especially right. if they're driving there. Um, so it's, it's an obvious thing for us because we're right smack dab in the middle of this um, yeah. industry and the space. But um, I think we're, we're starting to like get into the mainstream more where people are taking notice and saying, oh, these beverages do deserve um, maybe not top billing, although I think they do, but, um, you know, not like at the very bottom as an afterthought, you know, they, they deserve the, the space on the menu and the attention um, 
and the attention that all the, the other beverages deserve and get. What are your thoughts on the new dry bars that are popping up? Do you think that's going to last? Do you think that's here to stay? And do you think they're, we don't have one in Asheville yet. Actually, one just opened up about an hour from here. But do you think their customer base is sober or is it a mix? What do you know about well, I've been tracking all of the booze-free bars, the the dry bars, <laughs> as it were, um, and they're cropping up nonstop all the time. I think what we will see more of, rather than just a devoted brick-and-mortar space, is the pop-up concept. Um, the the sort of the first pop-up concept in the states that that I remember hearing about was the Sands Bar pop-up, mm -hmm. and then also Listen that Bar. Texas? in Texas, but then they, Chris Marshall has done like a national and international tour. He did a couple of stops in, in Canada, but um, he's done a, a couple of national tours where he brings that um, concept to different cities. Mm -hmm. And then Listen Bar in New York City had a, had a couple of um, pop-ups um, way back in the pre-pandemic, but mm -hmm. post sort of during, but mostly post-pandemic, um, I'm we're finding a lot of like, um, pop-up concepts um the the compella sisters in in la they have um a brand called zero proofed and they do all sorts of fun events they've done like silent discos and um right now they're doing like a holy um festival of color and doing like a bollywood dancing so it's some mm -hmm. sort of like event and the non-alc drink same with um elizabeth at absence of proof in new york and she's expanding to um i think seattle and la as well um she's sort of bringing um i i kind of feel like it's like the sex in the city vibes mm -hmm. but to to a booze free crowd um so it's very glamorous there's a lot of like menu pairings and people are feeling like super like sexy and chic and it's just all non-alc um so we're seeing a lot of pop-up concept but we also see a lot of um just the like a regular bar that's completely non-alc. I think what will keep them going is having some sort of food on the menu, um, an event space where they can do like karaoke nights, game nights, um, rent it, renting out the space like for others. I think it's, um, there, there's definitely business to be had. Um, it might not necessarily be a clientele of, um, People, I mean, obviously people who drink a lot aren't going to be going there, but I don't, I think it's a, it's a space where people can meet and congregate no matter if they drink or don't drink, but they can all share a really tasty beverage and an, a social experience together. And maybe it's their only stop of the night, but maybe it's their first stop of the night or their last stop. Um, I definitely think that the concept is here to stay and that probably what, what goes on at each place whether there's a retail channel, a lot of these booze-free bars also have like a, a bottle shop element. Um, I don't know really about the business side of, of running something like that. I'm sure it's difficult, but I think, um, I think the concept is here to stay. It's just um, a matter of getting creative with, with how the, the menu operations go and planning out events and all of that stuff. But I think it's a wonderful place for whomever whether they, wherever they are on the sobriety spectrum, um, ranging from just like being the designated driver and wanting something good and fun place to hang out to, to people who are in recovery or um, abstain for medical or religious reasons. So there's a, I think that, I think they're here to stay. My son just got home. Hi. <laughs> yeah, we just, we just signed on we just received an order from Benedictian in yes. Chicago. Yeah, that just shipped out this week. That's amazing. Yeah. Um, Bendicion Dry Bar. Bendicion. Yeah. Christina is great. And yeah, she's got the dry bar and the bottle shop concept. And she's one of the people I was thinking of as I was mentioning what, what really works is, you know, a strong set of like an event series. Um, and and then also maybe like a retail channel too. Mm -hmm. I can't imagine how difficult it is to run something like that, um, especially when you're competing with a lot of like alcoholic bars too. But um, she seems to be doing really well. I'd love to visit. I'd love to visit Bendicion one day. Yeah, it looks amazing. Um, so would you say based on the event you just got back from 
in the UK that most people involved in this movement are sober or in recovery or not necessarily? Is there a good percentage of people who are just looking to mix in non alcohol with their alcohol or yeah. choosing for physical health reasons? Yeah, I would say the majority of the people that are driving this movement, whether they're producers, consumers, um, bottle shop owners, bar owners, whatever, um, are mindful drinkers. Whether we agree with that term or not, or what it means to us, um, they are people that drink alcohol on, on a rare or occasional basis and want non-alcoholic beverages for the rest of the time. Um, but I would say the majority are not sober or in recovery. And um, of course, all of those people are welcome. But what I've what I've found just is that a lot of sort of the the many of the old school traditional recovery models for the longest time were not okay or were not really all about non-alcoholic beverages. At the end of the day, it's it's everyone's personal choice. And if there is a beverage out there that is a potential trigger for someone, they sh shouldn't drink it. They shouldn't have to drink it. They should have other options. Um, and at this, by the same token, there are a lot of people who aren't triggered by, you know, the non-alc gins or whiskeys or whatever, or beers or wines. And it could be a really like life-saving tool for them, whether they are in sobriety or, or, or just kind of moderating their drinking. So it's interesting, but I've actually seen that from, from where I sit on this side of the computer um, and the people I've interviewed and, and just sort of the brand stories that I've come across. Um, and then the consumers, it's, there's a whole range out there. And I would say the folks who are booze free um, due to like more recovery reasons um, make up a, a much smaller share than you might think um, or than one might think, but um, they're still there and they're still a really um, um, like ardent supporter of the movement. But there's, there's a lot of people that, that are drinking and just moderating. And I think that's cool too. I'm all about harm reduction. Any way to have people drink less, not go, you know, binging all the time is, is good with me. Like just looking at the different categories within non-alc and I think, you know, this, but we've, we've struggled a bit with our positioning within the category because we have ingredients like herbs and teas, but we don't, we don't want to be sitting next to ready to drink tea in like the center store with sodas and iced teas. Like we want to be sure we are positioned with that alternative alcohol set. Mm -hmm. So it's something we're having like some growing pains right now and looking at, you know, which area of the store are we going to best succeed in? Who is the category buyer? It's going to be different than the beverage buyer. Um, which stores are creating the alcohol-free sets too, which is, it's a new set in a lot of places. Yeah. Sometimes these, you'll see a couple of non-alc brands getting put with the mixers because mm -hmm. like the next best. You don't really know where to put them. Yeah. <laughs> right. So, so it requires education. Yeah. yeah. It's an interesting time though. Um, but I, I, I interviewed someone recently and he said the reason he wouldn't drink a non-alc beverage that tasted like alcohol is the next drink is going to be alcohol and this is controversial but this is a conversation we're having in the sober community is the safety factor of having a beverage that tastes like booze but is booze yeah. free and is that going to lead people to the booze yeah um, and it's, it's different for everyone. I think there's been a couple articles covering this topic recently that I saw on LinkedIn too, but what are your feelings about that? Well, first of all, I can't speak for a whole population. Um, I am not here to generalize. Um, and I know that everyone's situation is different and it's an individual choice. And, and that's one of the things that I really do drill down and home at Zero Proof Nation is that even drinking non-alcoholic beverages is a matter of personal choice. And I do have a disclaimer at the bottom of my website that says, please drink responsibly because there might be someone out there who is buying a case of non-alc beer and drinking it all in one night, hoping to get tipsy, hoping to get a little bit of a buzz. That's not the, that's not the reason to drink non-alc beers, you know? Mm -hmm. um, but- <laughs> 
or kombucha. Yeah. And, and that's, I, I used to drink a lot of it, not, um, at one sitting, but just like during the week, because it did help with my gut, but I had to avoid certain brands that made me feel a little loopier than others. And I, you know, I also had a lot of education to do myself, um, or rather I had a lot of learning to do regarding the alcohol by volume content of non-alc beverages. Some of them, as we know, can be up to 0.5% ABV, but in, in reality, that, that is no more than the alcohol content of a ripe banana, um, some yogurts, some other fermented foods like kimchi, um, and, and definitely kombucha as well. Um, trace alcohol will not in, in, in small, you know, moderated amounts will not get someone drunk, but there are people that cannot have any alcohol content at all um, for one reason or another. And, and that's something that they, they, they might ask for just 0.0, .0 because of certain reasons that they have. My opinion on, on the matter, just from a personal perspective, is that I don't believe that a non-alcoholic beverage can cause someone to drink an alcoholic beverage. And this is coming from someone who was very nervous about trying non-alc beer and non-alc wine for the first time, because I have my own long-term recovery. It's, it looks different from other people's, um, but it's still sobriety that has a time base of like, it's continuous sobriety from a, from a point A to present day. And I do not want to mess that up for a variety of reasons, including I don't want to, for me, start from scratch again, although I'll, I'll never forget what I've learned in my sobriety. Um, but I don't want to have to reset that clock, so to speak. And, um, and so I really struggled in the beginning, like, do I drink this? Do I not drink this? I dumped a lot of things down the sink with, without really knowing what was going on. Um, but I realize the way that I drink non-alcoholic beverages is the way that I romanticize drinking booze. Mm -hmm. I wanted a glass of wine to pair with dinner. I wanted to crack open a cold beer with friends at like, you know, um, a barbecue or just at home by myself. Like I wanted to be able to have a cocktail out with friends that would make me feel like I wasn't at the kitty table and mm -hmm. it was, was damn good too. Um, but I, that's how I drink non-alcoholic beverages, but that's not how I drink alcoholic beverages. So for me, um, with practice and knowing my own self, I, I know that drinking non-alcoholic beverages is not going to make me drink alcohol. However, there are a lot of people out there who have different types of brain chemistries and they have to be really, really cognizant of what's going on in their brains and in their bodies, um, where something can trigger a reaction in them. And they'll be like, oh, this is so like the original thing, but it's not causing a buzz in me. And maybe they don't have um, any sort of sobriety tools or moderation management tools. And they just, they're not getting the buzz that they feel like should be associated with that drink. And that might lead them maybe to want to get an alcoholic beverage, beverage period. Um, but I don't think that that's the majority of people. And again, that is, that's, I'm making a generalization without saying that I'm making a generalization. Um, I, I think that it's everyone's individual choice. And for me, I had to do a lot of my own education. I don't believe that that is the case for me now, but I can understand how anyone might consider that that, that could be the case for them. What I will say, and, and really got me fired up about reading some of those articles is some, uh, some of the, the talking heads, whether they were, um, addiction scientists or psychiatrists or whatever, we're speaking on behalf of a whole population saying drinking a mocktail will get you to drink an alcoholic beverage. Well, that's not true because everyone is different. So everyone should know yeah. themselves and should yeah. have a set of tools available and should have support systems and should sort of know what they're getting into. And maybe if they have addiction in their background to gravitate towards beverages that aren't trying to be anything else. Mm -hmm. like Stella you know, or like yeah, a Tosin, for instance, which is totally different. It's this beautiful, like bright orange uh, with ginger. It's not imitating anything. And so for, for people who might have addiction in their backgrounds, um, maybe to focus on beverages that aren't mimicking anything else. But at the end of the day, I think it's, it's everyone's individual um, brain chemistries and body chemistries and choices. And um, I think it's unfair to say that someone 
who's drinking a non-alcoholic beverage that is like an alcoholic beverage is automatically going to go out and get drunk. Yeah, it depends on the person. But yeah. I think what are you mentioned moderation <laughs> moderation tools? I think yeah. what is an example of a moderation tool? And is that for someone? Because I think you recently had a festival in DC, right? That the mindful drinking fest. Yeah. Right? Okay, so and that's another term. It's like mindfulness, moderation. Those are not the same as sobriety or right. being alcohol free. So how yeah. do you define the mindful drinking or moderation tools? So and that's not, and that's not yeah. for me, it's for right. other people out there who yeah. can safely consume yeah. alcohol. And it's not for me either. And yeah. it's, it's interesting because, you know, we're, we're kind of this unicorn. I know there are a couple of other people, um, Sierra from Pink Cloud Beverages, who I just featured, um, yesterday on Zero Proof Nation, she's been booze free for many, many years. Oh, cool! Um, and so, like, there are there are a handful of us that are like completely, yeah, you know, booze free, often because of some addiction issues or substance use disorder issues in our past. But a lot of the people that are producers out there don't necessarily have that, and a lot of I noticed that. Don't. So, so mindful drinking um, is definitely under. <laughs> Um, some scrutiny, I guess, in terms of the, the term itself, because there are going to be people who say, how can you mindfully drink alcohol? And I'll agree with them in, in how they phrase that. But I think what mindful drinking is really trying to get at is sort of the sober curiosity element where it's being aware of your alcohol consumption and saying, Am I drinking too much? Maybe I am. Let me intersperse this with some non-alcoholic beverages. Let me try periods of sobriety during the week. Um, you know, let me have four alcohol-free nights a week and three alcohol nights a week, or let me have six alcohol-free nights a week and one night where I uh, switch off between booze and and alcohol-free. So mindful drinking isn't about like, hmm, I'm gonna drink my alcoholic beverage so mindfully and think of what's <laughs> happening. I think it's more about being mindful of alcohol consumption and knowing when there might be a problem. And when, you know, for me, I can't drink alcohol safely. I don't want to, but um, technically there are people out there that can drink responsibly. Like they might have one drink a week even. And again, there are all sorts or of- they'll, op they'll open a bottle of wine and it'll sit in their fridge for a week. I know, like, I don't understand. <laughs> that that. And you know, I used to- I can't do that with a chocolate bar either though. Yeah. Well, in early, in early sobriety, I remember just like seeing people's drinks, like half drunk and they would leave and I would be you're like, you're not going to waste, you're not going to waste that, are you? What is wrong with you? You have to drink that. So, so I, yeah, I really think mindful drinking, it really is related more to being aware of alcohol consumption and for what it's worth, all of the, all of the beverages at the mindful drinking fest were completely alcohol free. Mm -hmm. Um, rather non-alcoholic they had they might have had 0.5 ABV or lower but some of them were 0, 0.0 um so that was the first I think that was the first answer to one of your questions what was the other question the um the tools for moderation tools. yeah I think I think those kind of go now I'm not a scientist I'm not an addiction specialist I'm not um a certified moderation management person facilitator but what I've sort of seen from the sober curious and mindful drinking movements is just the tools for moderating really have to do with knowing yourself. So maybe it's journaling um, and whether that's like writing about how you're feeling the next day after drinking alcohol um, or writing about how you're feeling the next day after not drinking alcohol. Like, do you, do you find the difference? Reading Sober Curious by Ruby Warrington is a great tool to start out with mm -hmm. um, because she, while she didn't, um, she coined the term, but of course she didn't coin the, the concept. Like people have been sort of sober curious for years before that book came out, but she, she put a name to what people were sort of experimenting with and then really kind of explored it from there. I think um, a, a, a big tool is just trying out several alcohol-free nights a week. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, interspersing alcohol free with, with alcohol. If that, if you are still drinking to, to incorporate more non-alcoholic beverages into your life and obviously to, to space things out, to pace yourself with water too. I mean, 
I'm, I don't know. <laughs> and those are, Just imagine those are, that it's being more like aware of what you're doing. Yeah. Those yeah. are also good tools for someone who's trying to decide maybe if they're an alcoholic or if alcohol is a real problem in their life those are tools they can try if, if they're yeah. not convinced. And if, if saying, you know, okay, three nights, 30 days, whatever it is, it's too hard to stay yeah. away from the alcohol, then that shows that that provides information. Yeah. And whether they consider themselves an alcoholic or are medically um, diagnosed as such, because there's, you know, there's like, there's medical textbook alcoholism, and then there's sort of a self um, identifying alcoholism for different from different programs, but there's also people who just choose to be alcohol free or abstain because they were gray area drinkers, which is another way of saying, you know, a mild to moderate substance use disorder. So mm -hmm. when I was sober, there was no there was no such term as substance use disorder. You were either an alcoholic or you were normal, and that was really really alienating and for sure. Unfair. There, because while there were a lot of people who did feel like, yeah, I am an alcoholic, like I can't do this safely. There were other people like me who, who recognized I could not drink safely, but I just didn't see myself as an alcoholic, but there was no other term I could use. And so when science caught up and, and substance use disorder was introduced into the DSM and mild, moderate, and severe, it's a spectrum. So just like there's a substance use disorder spectrum, there's a sobriety spectrum too. And you can be sober for a night or a month, or nine months, or like a year, or the rest of your life, and there's, it's all, there's all some gray area in everything. I love how open-minded you are, because, you know, this is a topic where it does often get pretty black and white, Yeah. And, you know, for some people, there's black and white thinking, so it's really, it helps me open my mind and eyes up to all the possibilities as well. I like that idea of you know, people get to choose like where they are on the sober spectrum. And, and I know where I am and I can, yeah. you know, hold, um, hold that for myself, but it doesn't mean it has to look the same for someone else. Yeah. Um, and I've, by the way, Sarah, I've, I've come to a whole new understanding from just five years ago or six years ago, or whenever it was that I started my mm -hmm. very first sort of foray into the online community world, which was called the Sobriety Collective. And it was more about alternative recovery, alternative sobriety. Um, and I thought, oh, you know, straight edge people, they can't possibly understand what I've gone through because they haven't dealt with, you know, the, the trauma that I've been through regarding alcohol. But where I am now is I just, I see that there are so many ways that people can be alcohol free and they're all valid and they all deserve um, celebrating and inclusion. Mm -hmm, exactly. Yeah. And what would you say the difference between being dry and sober is? That's an interesting one because I, <laughs> I remember, you know, certain passages in a certain book alluding to, you know, be dry drunk. And um, I understand really what that's alluding to. It's, it's just, you know, not drinking, but not addressing your issues. That's what that was saying. But I don't think the word dry is a bad word. Um, I think the, you know, being dry and being sober are all parts of the same spectrum. It's just how you choose to identify. Sober for a lot of people is related to recovery. Um, and sober for a lot of people might not be related to recovery, but it may sound kind of somber and boring. And so I am sober, I am in recovery, but I choose to identify as booze free because that just makes me okay. feel more lighthearted and, um, you know, I'm, I'm serious and very vigilant about my sobriety. I don't want to, uh, can I swear on this? I don't want to swear on yeah, this. Yeah, you can swear. I don't want to, I don't want to F it up at all, you know, <laughs> but at the same time, I've, I've come to a lot of different understandings and new understandings over, over time. And I think if someone identifies as dry, um, again, different from the dry drunk in certain passages, right? I think that sort of refers to a certain type of person who may have stopped drinking, but hasn't started addressing issues. But mm -hmm. if, if someone wants to be dry and doesn't want to consider themselves quote sober or quote an alcoholic, um, that's okay too. I think it's self-identification is, is really empowering. And, um, there are people who require medical detox and, um, professional, residential treatment and, and 
those are options that are available for people like treatment is treatment works if it's something that someone needs and wants. Um, and I, I went through my own treatment journey. I, I had an intensive outpatient program um, for five weeks, and that was what I was able to afford time-wise and um, financially. I had to still go to work. I couldn't just take 30 days off and go to residential treatment. But um, I, I think treatment is, is something that a lot of people do need and a lot of people want as well. But it doesn't mean that everyone who has issues with alcohol needs treatment. It just right. might mean that they are on a different journey and need to find their way and will find their way, but don't necessarily need the help of, of um, addiction professionals, but they might benefit from a, a sobriety coach or a gray area drinking coach. And, and um, there are all sorts of different communities out there that can serve different types of needs across the sobriety spectrum and across the substance use disorder spectrum. So I think it's a great time if people are considering um, quitting or moderating or just doing something different. There's so yeah. much now that there, there wasn't available when I was. Exactly. When I, was I know. I think we, we got sober around the same time. Huh. I was 2006 and yeah, I was just a year later. Yeah. It wasn't cool. It wasn't, <laughs> no. I didn't want anyone to know. I mean, I'm really happy for people now, regardless of what the reason is, if yeah. they're choosing to explore the journey of being alcohol free or moderating, I'm just really, really happy that it's easier now and that there's more resources and there's more options for socializing without it, because that was my biggest concern is just not having a social life. Yeah. Oh God, um, it's the death of my social life in the beginning. Yeah. <laughs> and I didn't think, I mean, I, I don't want to age you at all, but I was 24 when I quit mm -hmm. I had to quit. Um, and and I just turned 24. So I was like, how no, am I supposed to be in my, how am I supposed to be in my 20s and not drink? Because that was, that was what was society everything. was telling us. Like you yeah. can't drink alcohol to have fun. But now yeah. we're seeing, especially with Gen Z, but millennials too, and really anyone in any generation, but the, the Gen Z generation is really driving. Like you can have a, you don't have to have alcohol to have a great time. And you can, I mean, they're just, they're making it look really effortless and cool. And it's so nice to be cool and not drink because back in our day, we were the odd man out, right? I feel like drinking's almost become, it's almost becoming like cigarettes in society. Like there in certain it's parts of there, the Like maybe in a decade, we'll see what happens. But yeah. <laughs> I saw a stat that 45% of Gen Zers are not drinking anything or sorry, not consuming alcohol. Yeah. They'll be drinking the functional beverages and maybe the beverages with CBD. Um, and then yeah, that's yeah. a whole other episode. I oh, do sure. drink beverages with CBD, but I'm, okay. I don't know how I feel about like THC. I don't think I want that, or I'm still trying to figure out what the heck kava is. And, um, yeah. you know, there's, but at the end of the day, it's everyone's personal choice, knowing themselves and, and having a support system available just in case mm -hmm. they need to reach out to someone. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I attended the brand directory, um, uh, webinar yesterday and it, it was mainly alcohol, uh, adult beverages in the alcohol space. Um, but they were talking a bit about where people, it's not that people want to lose the buzz. It's not that they want to be buzz free. It's just kind of moving away from the alcohol. So there's yeah. other things. Yeah. Functional yeah. ingredients. They don't want to harm their, their bodies and they don't want to have hangovers, but people are looking for sort of an elevated experience with social life. And I think that can work for a lot of people. I don't want it because I want to have my mental faculties, but I think it can be safe for a lot of other people. And I think if they're not drinking alcohol, I'm, I'm happy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so what's next for Zero Proof and what's going on in DC right now in the sober community? So, well, that's a different thing, like the booze-free beverage community and the sober community are different um, in right. my world, right? That's so right. I don't really, I don't really know what's going on in the the sober sober community, but I'll tell you in DC what's going on in the, in the non alk beverage scene. Um, we've got a booze free bar called Binge Bar, which has been open for a couple of months now, is doing really great. Um, the owner Gigi, have you connected with her yet? No, I need because to. If not, then I will, I will introduce you. She is fantastic. Um, she's Filipina American. I 
believe. Um, I know that she's got a Filipino background and brings those elements to her menu. So she's got like light bites. Um, she does karaoke nights. I thought I was going to be the host at one point, but um, she does karaoke nights and game nights and like um, she's doing a lot with with the community and she's in the heart of um, Northeast DC. In Old Town Alexandria, which is a bit further south, is um, Samantha Caston. She goes by Sam of Umbrella Dry Drinks, the area's non-alcoholic bottle shop. Have you connected with her? No. That's another thing I will help you with because she runs an absolutely adorable non-elk bottle shop. She does some pop-up events and she's just so knowledgeable about all of the products and wants to make sure that people have a great experience when they walk in the door um, and that they get to try things so that they don't just buy things off the shelf and don't know what, what it is that they're buying. Um, and she just, she's very welcoming. And so she's got the, the area's only non-elk bottle shop right now. Um, of course, we had the Mindful Drinking Fest that was spearhead, spearheaded by Derek Brown and his team. And I was part of the team. Um, I think they're planning one on the West Coast next. I don't know much about it, but I will see what I can find out. And then we have a lot of bars and restaurants that are, I mean, when I started Booze Free in DC, there were a handful that were having maybe like a cocktail or two, but we have more than I can count now, um, bars and restaurants that have really great non alcoholic options on the menu, whether they're um, bringing in RTDs um, or, or spirits and, and making mixed drinks, or they're doing their, their own thing behind the bar. Um, they're, they're creating options that are worthy of, of menu space. And then um, with Zero Proof Nation, I am very close to launching a global map of all of the non-elk bars and bottle shops in the world. Um, it's something I've been tracking for the past three years. And um, it's very, very close to seeing the light of day and making it accessible to everyone. Anyone who wants to know, like if they're traveling to Belgium or right. they're traveling to um, Malaysia or they're, you know, just going on a road trip um, in the States and want to, you know, hit up the East Coast or wherever, they'll be able to see by icon where all the bottle shops that have brick and mortar are. Also, e-commerce has its own little logo. Um, again, with the bars, I'm putting the pop-up concept sort of home base in, in the map, but they often don't have like a, a geographic location. They just might be in a city. So mm -hmm. some of those will be sort of approximate locations. But again, all of the booze-free bars that have um, an actual home, they're going to be on the map too. And what I would ask for, for folks listening and watching um, to enable all of this content to remain free for all, I would love for anyone out there to buy me a coffee um, or buy me 10 or 100 or 200. Someone bought me 200 cups of coffee, which was a thousand dollars. But okay. really people are getting like anywhere between five and 25. That's a great ask. How do they buy you a cup of coffee? Well, there's a link that I will provide you with. It's also on my website. I have it all over LinkedIn. I'm going to do some social pushes, but um, it's literally buymeacoffee.com slash zero proof nation. And there are two options. People can do like a one-time support donation, whether that's even just like a $5, you know, thank you for doing what you do. Here's a cup of coffee um, to, to, keep, to keep you going. Or there's a membership model as well, like a subscription model where um, it's a recurring, a recurring charge for them. And I might do some special content down the road that's just for members. Um, but for now, it's, it's really been um, one-time supporters and it's ranged. Um, from you know the bare minimum to more than I could have anticipated. Um, but it's just a way to keep the content accessible to everyone, but to help offset a lot of my own costs that I've incurred along the way. Um, you know, the most of which has been time, but I yeah, do, do pour a lot of my it, zero proof nation is bootstrapped. You're doing a lot. You're doing yeah, a lot. It's, it's it a seems like really a labor it's, of love. And I, I know you're yeah. you're offering a lot of free resources and yeah. it's such a great service that people can access that map so we'll definitely make a note of that and um really excited for that project to see it too for international travel that's amazing and if someone's listening and like how are people letting you know about their bottle shops or are you out there just scouring using chat gpt for the latest and greater or do people email you every day with new so yeah um 
I haven't been getting a lot of emails from folks, fan mail or otherwise, <laughs> in a while. Um, but so there are two ways. One, up until like two weeks ago or, or last week, I was doing all of the research on my own and I've done a pretty good job with that. But I'm just one person and I can't do everything. So what I decided to do, and I don't know why I didn't do this sooner, is have different forms on, on the site to submit your own bottle shop, to submit your own bar, to submit your own beverage. Um, that can also be uh, interpreted as if someone goes to a bottle shop that exists or a bar that exists that I don't know about. They can also just mm -hmm. input their, their, you know, their favorite place. Um, but it's really technically meant for the operators of these places. And they, if they don't see themselves on the directory, it's not because I don't like them. It's because I just don't know how I can know everything. Um, so I would say where we are right now, I've got probably 90% of what exists in the world on the map and in the directories. Um, but there's probably going to be a 10% that I just can't know about because it's happening, you know, in real time. Wow. I can't wait to see the international <laughs> map. That's so, that's so cool. I heard it's really growing fast in Germany. Yeah. Well, all over really. I mean, the one place, there were two places really, but the one place that's not growing super fast and I'd love to see that change is in Latin America. Okay. There's not anything that I know of yet in Central America. And there's only one um, country in South America that has anything going on. That's Chile. And they have a, an e-commerce bottle shop and a non-alcoholic wine company called Sin Cero, Sin Zero in English, but mm -hmm. Sin Cero in Spanish, uh, which also means sincere. Mm -hmm. um, and, and Chilean wine is a big deal. So this is a Chilean non-alcoholic wine company. Um, and they started for health reasons, um, medical reasons. So mm -hmm. Latin America is a big opportunity. Um, Africa has one non-alcoholic bar called Eden Bar, and that's in Ghana. Oh, interesting. Um, South Africa has a few um, e-commerce bottle shops. Mm -hmm. And then we're seeing more in the Middle East. There's two um, e-commerce stores that are booming with business called Drink Dry in Kuwait and Dubai. And then there's a series of, of non-alc bars in the Middle East as well. Okay. Um, the rest of Asia, not much. There's an India, there's something in India and Singapore has some stuff. And then Australia and Oceania is also a really big area for non-alc. But I would say the UK, the US and Australia are sort of the biggest. Um, so North America, Canada has a lot going on too. So North America, um, Europe really, mm -hmm. um, and Oceania, Australia are the three biggest continents with alcohol free mm -hmm. going on. So it'll be an interesting thing to actually witness the full sort of visualization, the data visualization of, of where everything is. Um, and knowing that that's, that's just phase one, um, maybe phase two is, is raising some real funds and then getting, you know, hiring a, a map developer, someone who, who knows how to put this into like an app that's searchable by, by type right now. It's, it's, it's going to be a Google map, but it's pretty sophisticated Google map. I don't say so mm -hmm. myself, <laughs> but it's, yeah, yeah, it's just something. We work with Nearest You, which is a pretty simple map integration tool for a website as well. Nearest You, okay. That might use Mapbox as, um, so Mapbox is sort of the other thing besides Google Maps. Um, and a lot of these like um, sort of store locator maps yeah. use Mapbox as sort of their base. And then they, then they have like separate companies like Nearest You and there's another one. Um, yeah, but those, I think, I believe those, and, and this is just me sort of spitballing here, but I believe those need um, actual like geo coordinates for a place. So like you're getting it at a retail shop, you're getting it at a, at a restaurant. And um, I've been able to find a way on Google Maps anyway, to just um, put in like a city um, for like where a pop-up concept might be. Okay. But for all the map developers that are listening. <laughs> Reach out know, to Laura, you're going to get inundated. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really happy with where it is for phase one and it can always grow. Congratulations, Laura. Thank you so much for spending time with me today. Thank you, Sarah. Yes. I'm honored you invited me. Yes, I've learned a lot today and I really, like I said, just appreciate the open-minded nature as this movement is growing and changing and evolving and 
lots of different types of people coming in for different reasons. I, um, I really appreciate your approach to it all. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Let us know if there's anything we can do to support and I'll be sure to get all those links um, yep. put in the notes. Good. Okay. Wonderful. Have a great weekend. You too. Bye.